He's a German particle physicist. Dr. Hoyer studied particle physics at the University of Stuttgart and, and obtained his PhD in 1977 at the University of Heidelberg. He worked for many years at, the, at DESI, the German electron synchrotron, and at the Opal experiment at CERN, later becoming its spokesperson. He became a full professor in 1998, and in 2004 was appointed DESI's research director. His tenure as director general of CERN was just extended by another second term. This is the second time it has happened in the history of CERN. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome him on stage. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And I must say, I'm impressed. <laughs> That's great. OK, so let's see how it is after the lecture. <clears throat> OK, so I gave this talk the title. Now, and you have to, ex sometimes I need to move a little bit so I might become uh, lower tone or higher. So we will see. Research at CERN, from the highest energies to the smallest particles. And first I thought not everybody might in detail know what CERN is. So <clears throat> I have a few words about the mission of CERN. The mission of CERN is fourfold, and there's a very strong relation to the mission of METU. Yeah? Research, of course, that is our raison d'etre. Innovation, you cannot do research without innovation. You need innovative technologies, yeah? Of course, education and training. And finally, bringing the world together, CERN uniting people. So in research, what we want to do is we want to push forward the frontiers of knowledge. We want to understand the secrets of the Big Bang. What happened in the early universe, yeah? I think everybody is asking this from time to time. You might know it or not know it, that you ask it yourself, but I think everybody asks it to, to themselves. What was the, in the matter like in the first moments of the universe existence? In order to do that, we have to develop new technologies for accelerators, for detectors, but also in information technology. And I don't know, I'm, if I look around here, the average age is pretty low. It's very good. <clears throat> Who is around 20 or below 20? Oh, right. Well, some are cheating, I think. Okay, but. <laughs> okay. But the ones who are now 20 or below 20, they have never seen a world without the World Wide Web. Yeah? Maybe you are thinking the World Wide Web was created at the moment of the Big Bang. It's not true. It's not true. It was, it was born at CERN 1989 when our experiments became so international that we needed a platform to exchange information quickly and reliably between those who had the right to access it. That was the World Wide Web, and it has changed our world. Today, it's the grid computing or the cloud computing, and I have one transparency on the medical application. But we cannot do that if we don't train the scientists and engineers of tomorrow. And I think every country, wherever I go, it's clear, scientists and engineers are missing. And don't forget, our society is based on science. Yeah? Without science, we would not be as we are now. So don't forget that. So we need the young people. And one thing which I'm really proud of is to unite people, to bridge countries and cultures. This is very, very important. OK, CERN was founded in 1954 by 12 European states. And don't forget, the first discussion was starting 1949, just after the World War. So you can really call it science for peace. And I think METU was founded shortly afterwards. I think so we are, we are somehow in the same age. Today we have 20 member states. You see them there, all from Europe. But there was a very important step done by the CERN Council in 2010 because we redefined the E in CERN from Europe to everywhere. That means all countries, independent of their geographical location, can become members of CERN. Today, 
We have three countries coming up for full membership. They are already associate members, Romania, Israel, and Serbia. Serbia just two and a half weeks ago. And we have three applicant states, Cyprus, Slovenia, and Turkey. And I very much hope that Turkey very soon will join the family of CERN. And we have states from outside Europe, like uh, uh, Brazil, applying soon for associate membership. So we are becoming a more global family now. We have roughly 2,300 uh, staff members, around 1,000 other paid personnel. These are people like young people just graduating or young PhD, stu PhD students. We have more than 10,000 scientific users from all over the world. And our budget is around 1 billion Swiss franc in order to support all this. And here you see the map. Science is getting more and more global. This is the distribution of all the CERN users, not by their passport, but by the nation of their institute. And you see, essentially, from all over the world, and the majority, of course, are the blue ones, roughly 70% from the member states. And Turkey has, on this plot, around 80 uh, users. However, if you count also the master students, I think we are roughly at, uh, at 100. And this is one thing which I specifically like with Turkey, that many young people. That's important. That's our future. And we have education activities. So we start with a teacher school. We have every week we have many teachers on campus in order to get lectures and to, to work with the scientists. So we have teacher schools all over the year. These teachers, they come back at their home country, yeah? And they are re-motivated, yeah? So it's fantastic to see they get in touch with the scientists, and then hopefully they produce more physics students. This is a photo of last year's um, summer students uh, assembly gathering in, at CERN. So out of these f summer students, we get hopefully some young researchers and we have schools of particle physics, school of computing, accelerator school, rotating in the member states. So I hope soon one of the schools is coming to, to Turkey, and I hope the first school will be an accelerator school. I think we are in discussion there. Whoever survives this might become a scientist at CERN, and this is the way you can make your career through the high particle physics. For the teacher's program, you see this is a distribution uh, over the past 12, 13 years. But I must tell you that at the moment we have 1,000 teachers per year going through, the, uh, through that school. So it started slowly, but now we are at the maximum of 1,000. And if I'm not mistaken, I can't read it very well from here, but I think Turkey has only had three teachers up to now at CERN. So I think there's an improvement possible. And I hope with the membership it will become a boost, get a boost, and we get more people there. More teachers. Maybe one more word about CERN technologies and innovation. And one prime example is the Hadron therapy. It combines physics, information technology, biology, and medicine to fight cancer. And you know, the Hadron therapy, you can do this very, very targeted way with protons or with light ions. With x-rays, you hurt the, the surrounding healthy tissue. However, with protons or with ions, you can target the tumor much, much better. And this is something where we are helping to work on with other laboratories. And one of the prime aims now is to make these apparatus, these, these accelerators, smaller and cheaper so that they can be used everywhere. And in imaging, it is very important uh, to have good detectors for our research. And these detectors can be used in medical applications. Since 40 years, they are used, for example, in positron emission tomography. And also, the way you detect the particles in positron emission tomography today allow to combine it with magnetic spin resonance. So this is important. Detectors developed for our large beasts at LHC are today used in the hospital. And just one more remark for those who don't know what the P stands for in the PET. It's positron emission tomography. The positron is the antiparticle to the electron. So antimatter is nothing mysterious. It was mysterious when it was introduced 80 years ago. Today you use it in hospitals. Okay, that may be also a mystery, but okay, fine. 
so far about the implications, applications, etc. Let's go now to the science. And what is today's, one of today's scientific challenges is to understand the very first moments of our universe after the Big Bang. And you see the Big Bang on the left-hand side and today's universe on the right-hand side. And it developed over roughly 14 billion years. And it started with a very hot, tiny point, and then expanding in all directions, cooling down, becoming bigger and bigger. Today, the universe has a size of 10 to the 28 centimeters. Now, don't ask me. I don't know what 10 to the 28 centimeters mean. Maybe I can help you. If you replace the centimeter by dollars, you have roughly the square of the American deficit. I don't know if that helped you. At least it helped me to, to, to understand that the American deficit is rather large. OK, fine. OK, getting serious again. This is, again, the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang on the left top to today on the, on the right bottom from essentially 0 to 10 to the 28 centimeters. And it's difficult, as I just said, to, under, to imagine what means 10 to the 28 or what, what mean the large dimensions. But I think it's equally impossible to imagine the small dimensions. From a certain point on, everything for me is 0. Yeah? However, there are huge differences once you go to smaller, uh, to smaller distances. What we can imagine is the center of the ruler, the human dimension. And I put here the young Rutherford. Because with Rutherford, one and now 101 years ago, essentially nuclear physics started when he found out, <laughs> to say it in a jokey way, we are essentially all empty. Yeah? Because, I mean, the atoms consist out of the nucleus and then a few electrons around it. The rest are forces. So we are essentially empty, independent how much your, your uh, balance gives your weight. Uh, okay. But how to look into the universe now? We can do it with looking into the history of the universe using space-based telescopes or ground-based telescopes. And you see on the right bottom the AMS. AMS is the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is if I'm not mistaken, the only, but at least the largest scientific instrument on the International Space Station, and METRO is participating in this experiment, by the way. And we, CERN, are also participating because we are getting all the data from the space station to CERN into the analysis center. So, and as I said, METRO is participating in this experiment, which is, which is an exciting experiment. However, looking into the universe with the large telescopes, you don't get very close to the Big Bang. You only get roughly to 300,000, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. You don't get closer. Because during the time until, let's say, 380,000 years, the universe was so hot that no atoms could form, and all the light was always ionizing uh, the atoms, so no light could get any information out of the universe. Only once the universe was cool enough, roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang, atoms could form, light could escape, and you, you have the information from that time, which is relatively close compared to the 14 billion years, but not as close as we come with our super microscope the Large Hadron Collider, we come down to, uh, to distances of 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 centimeters, much smaller than the proton, the, the, uh, the nucleus of the, of the hydrogen atom. And in this way, you see, we come time-wise very close to the Big Bang. We come as close as one millionth of a millionth of a second. You will agree this is pretty close at least in human dimensions. In the dimensions of the development of the universe, a tremendous amount has happened during that time. So that means in order to understand more about the early universe, we have to measure a millionth of a millionth of a second, very, very detailed what happened there in order to be able to extrapolate further to the Big Bang. And that's our challenge. And what we know today is that, as I said, 
we know that the atoms are consisting of nuclei and electrons. We know today also that the nucleus is consisting out of protons and neutrons. And in turn, the protons and neutrons are consisting out of quarks and gluons. So this is our today knowledge, the today's atomo. At 100 years ago, atomos, the, the undivisible or whatever it's called in English, was the atomos, the atom. Today, it's the quarks, which are the smallest constituents of matter we know at least. And once we study now the physics laws of the first moments after the Big Bang, we have a fantastic symbiosis between particle physics on the small scale, astrophysics, astroparticle physics on the large scale, and cosmology. And this is what fascinates not only me, also many of the young people, and which brings the young people, and hopefully you also, into science. And that's what we need, young people in science, because the young people are our future, and also in our future for science. Now let's look what we have learned about the top right, about the quarks and the, and the, and the gluons. This is what we have learned over the last 50 years, Oh, the status of our st standard model. The physical world is composed out of quarks and leptons, and you see on the right bottom, you see three families of quarks, these are the reddish ones, and the leptons, these are the green ones. But you have three families. And actually, we all, we all, everybody here, consists only out of the first family. Out of the up quark and the down quark, this forms the protons and the neutrons. And the electron, makes the atom. So these three particles is all for us. We all consist only out of these particles. That's all. Amazing, huh? We are so different. OK, the difference comes from other part. OK. It's amazing. Only the first family. Then nature introduced the second family and the third family. And the only difference between the three families is that the mass of the particles is bigger and bigger. So the mass of the top quark, which is on the top right in the red box, the mass of the top quark is as, the top quark is as heavy as a gold atom. It's very heavy, but it's a fundamental point-like particle. Now imagine a point-like particle, heavy like a gold atom. And we don't know why. Huh? This is one of the uh, mysteries which we have to solve. OK, so this is all. This is the periodic system of the microcosm. So I would say, if you compare it to the periodic system of, in chemistry, it's much easier. Particle physics is much easier than chemistry. OK. Well, some people might believe it. On the right-hand side, you have in the, in the light blue, you have the force carriers. Because you have these matter particles, they have to exchange the information about forces. They have to interact. And there are the four force carriers, the photon for the electromagnetic force, the gluon for the strong force, which holds the, the nuclei together, and the Z and W for the weak force, for example, responsible for the processes in the sun. OK, so we have three families of four particles each and these force carriers, and that's all what makes the standard model of particle physics and which also describes, describes at least part of our universe. Now, this is a static model. You have now to understand the, the dynamics. And the dynamics is a mathematical formalism which describes the interactions which are happening through weak forces, electromagnetic and strong forces. And we have tested this standard model with very high precision. And it resists to all these tests. It stands up very well to all these tests. So this is fantastic. On the one hand, this is a fantastic achievement. On the other hand, it is frustrating. Because there's one piece missing within the standard model, a very important piece. And this is the question, what is the origin of mass of elementary particles? We don't know that yet. And this is my only formula, by the way, on the transparency. So don't get worried. So mass you can also define as a property of the particle which determines the velocity with which the particle moves. So if the, if the particles have all the same energy E, 
the heavier the particle, the more massive the particle it is, the more slowly it moves. Yeah? The heavier, the more slowly with the same energy. And this was, can be achieved through the introduction of a scalar field. What is a scalar field? A scalar is just a number. A scalar field is something which is everywhere and does not have a preferred direction. So it's everywhere in the same direction. It has the same value everywhere. And this scalar field was introduced inter alia by Mr. Peter Higgs and the, Bo and the particles acquire their mass through the interaction with this Higgs field. And the self-interaction of the field is the famous Higgs boson, or what Leon Lederman called the God particle. Now this sounds a bit abstract. For the lay people, now I have some illustration. Suppose this is a party of journalists after the cold buffet, because then they are equally distributed in the room. They are a scalar field. They are like the Higgs field. And now Hoyer comes into the door on the left-hand side and wants to go through with the velocity of light. Nobody knows him. I get through with nothing. I'm massless. Now suppose somebody comes in, because I have no interaction with the journalists. Now somebody comes in whom the journalists know. OK, but, um, okay fine. So I think they know him. What happens? They cluster around him. They interact with him. And he slows down. He acquires mass. And the better known the person, the more journalists cluster around the person, the more heavy that person becomes. OK? That's, that's the Higgs mechanism. Yeah? That's the interaction of the particle with the field. So how to imagine then the self-interaction? Well, suppose Hoyer whispers a rumor into the room, okay? Now journalists are curious. What did he say? That's a self-interaction of the field. That's the Higgs boson, okay? Don't you agree that particle physics is very easy? Yeah? Okay. That's a so, with these pictures, even I understood the Higgs mechanism, finally. So, this is the way we can describe, to some extent, particle physics. Now, the, prob and the, Higgs, the, the problem is the Higgs particle is the last missing cornerstone of our standard model. And we know everything about this particle, all its properties. We just don't know if it exists. Okay, so this is why we have to see if, it, if we find it or not. And I will come back at the end of the talk to that question. But there are many other questions open in the, which are not solved in particle physics. Can we unify the forces at the high energy at the, at the beginning of the universe? In how many space dimensions do we live? Are we really living only in three space dimensions? I don't know. It's difficult to imagine, but who knows in how many space dimensions we are living. And the other question, this standard model is fantastic, but it just describes merely 5% of the universe, of the matter and energy density of the universe. 95% is dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter is roughly one quarter of the dark universe. It clumps like normal matter. We know it's there, but we don't know what it is. And three quarters is dark energy. And dark energy drives the universe apart in all, di in all directions. We have not the faintest clue what this dark energy is. So it took us 50 years for the standard model. Now we have to start looking into the, and this only describes 5%. Now we have to look into the 95%. Yeah? This is the future. And this is, these are, really questions which LHC will address most of these questions. So what are the solutions? And I have put here Nobel Prize winners all connected to the standard model. It's amazing how many Nobel Prize winners were connected to the standard model. There's only one who didn't get the Nobel Prize yet, and he's in color. That's Peter Higgs. So we better find his particle in order to give him the Nobel Prize. So will this standard model be successful forever? 
I don't know. We will see. There could be supersymmetry beyond, or extra dimensions, or technicolor, and God knows what for all the physicists. Or on the left-hand side, you see the theorist who scratches his head or her head. The point is, for all proposed solutions beyond the standard model, new particles should appear at the TV scale or beyond or below. It is the territory of the Large Hadron Collider. And that brings me now to the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is situated uh, in the Geneva area, 20, 100 meters underground. It is the largest scientific instrument ever built, or at least one of the largest scientific instruments ever built. 27 kilometers of circumference, more than 10,000 people involved in design, construction, exploitation now. It collides protons to reproduce the conditions at the birth of the universe 40 million times a second, quite often. 40 million times a second. And how is it done? You see you have the blue and the red tube in this 27 kilometers. In one of the tubes, the, party, the protons are running anti-clockwise, in the other part clockwise. And then at several points, you bring them to collision and you measure what happens in these collisions. But first, you have to construct the uh, accelerator. And these are the typical magnets. And we have 1,200 of these magnets, each 18 meters long. They go down the 100 meters are then transported to the place where they should sit in the 27 kilometers ring. They are put into position and then moved inside so that they connect with the other magnets. And then you have to interconnect the magnets. You see that's done by welding the connections which have to carry more than 10,000 ampere once the machine is running. And then that's done. And this is the way I like it, because then we can take data. Then the thing is done. Now, this LHC, this Large Hadron Collider, is one of the coldest places in the universe. It has temperatures of, it's run a temperature of minus 271 Celsius or 1.9 Kelvin above the absolute zero. And it's colder than outer space. Outer space is 2.7 Kelvin. So we are running the 27 kilometers at temperatures lower than outer space in order not to have too much uh, resistance in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the current leads. So it's one of the coldest places in the universe. And at the same time, it's one of the hottest places in the galaxy because the collisions of the two protons creates, generates temperatures much, much higher than in, 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 in the sun. Now, if you, if you look on the energy of the proton against the proton, the energy itself is like a mosquito hitting another mosquito in full fly. Well, you don't get very close to the early universe with this. However, this energy in the collision is generated in a, on a very tiny spot. The energy density, that means the energy divided by the area of the proton, is very, very high because the proton diameter is so small. So it's the energy density which creates, which, which generates that. And by this, in this way, in a single collision, we come so close to the Big Bang. So we are colliding 2,800 bunches on, in one direction with, with 2,800 bunches in the other direction. So we have 40 million crossings per second. And per packet, per bunch, we have 100 billion protons. So you have 100 billion protons every 25 nanoseconds going through each other. And if you, if you don't squeeze them, if, the, if you don't make them denser, they will not collide. But when you squeeze them, when you make them very dense, they will collide, and some of the protons will collide, and then we can measure what comes out. So we send these packets around all the time for many, many hours, and every 25 nanoseconds we have a collision, we have collisions. And in each of these collisions we, we produce many, many charged particles, which means we have to measure all these particles. We have to measure their trajectories and their, their, their properties, and that takes a long time, and that takes, is a challenge for the detectors, for the data collection, and for the storage. And in 2010, when we turned on the machine, we entered a new era in fundamental science. And we have four big experiments 
sitting around the circumference, where we collide the particles and where we want to measure what comes out of these collisions. Okay? So, why do we have four experiments? Well, we have two general purpose detectors, CMS and ATLAS, and Turkey is involved in both of these experiments very strongly. And this university here is involved in the CMS experiment. And you need two experiments. You need two cross-checks. Yeah? One message here for the young people is, don't believe a single measurement. Always cross-check it. It always has to be cross-checked by somebody else. That's very important. In addition, we have specialized detectors like the detector LHCB. And this, is, this study is a very particular question. It studies the question, why are we at all here? Because at the beginning of the universe, you had matter and antimatter produced in equal quantities. Now, matter and ant antimatter annihilate, they radiate to energy when they meet. So that means, in principle, we should all be in energy. However, nature introduced a small asymmetry between matter and antimatter, one part in 10 billion. And this one part in 10 billion is now sitting here and standing here. This one part in 10 billion is the matter-dominated universe. We know that this happened, but we don't know all the conditions how this happened. And this is important to find out. And this experiment is addressing that question. And the fourth experiment is a special, specialized detector to study the collisions when we don't collide protons, but we collide lead ions. And then you create, you produce this hot, dense matter, and you want to study the properties of this hot, dense matter. And that experiment is doing that. But there is also complementarity between these experiments. There's an overlap in physics between the top three. And the key issue is to identify the particles which could give some idea about the antimatter matter asymmetry, like the heavy quarks. And there's also overlap in physics reach between the bottom three, because they both can register. And this is, this is fantastic. Imagine you have huge detectors. And they can measure 20,000 charged particle trajectories in one collision. This is amazing. You have to do this. You, 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 have, to, you have to imagine what, what kind of engineering and electro, electronics and mechanical engineering you need for that. It's fantastic. So the versatility of the LHC and the complementarities of the experiments make the whole of LHC a much more powerful instrument than the sum of its parts. OK. And now let's look, and I apologize to Metu now. I have Atlas, OK? These are the largest and most complex detectors. And now imagine, imagine the size. You see here in the middle, this is the size of an average technician. OK, some got the joke, OK. But you see, these are 20 times 20 times 40 cubic meters filled, this is during construction, filled with electronics, with, with detector particles, parts. And within the whole volume, we measure the trajectories of the particles with an accuracy roughly of the diameter of the human hair. In the whole thing. This you have to imagine. So that's fantastic. Now keep in mind now, the eightfold symmetry the red stripes, everything. What's that? Anybody got an idea? Now this is the stage design for an opera. And look. I mean, <laughs> huh? The size is different. The material is also different. OK, but what does it tell you? It tells you that our instruments are not only scientifically interesting, make, elect, um, interesting for engineering, but also for artists. And Birgit just mentioned that before. And therefore, I have introduced a new program, which is called Collide at CERN. <laughs> Usually, we collide particles. But now we also collide artists and scientists. And I, I will be one of the detectors to see what comes out of that. <laughs> but I can tell you, 
it will be interesting because these guys resonate. Yeah, it's fantastic. We had the first discussion, uh, public discussion between an artist and a scientist, two completely different people. I, so it will be interesting to see what comes out. No, I'm. I'm it's it's important. And when I see here at the university, you have these arts exhibition outside the painting. That's all the same. Okay, now back to physics. What are the basic processes at the LHC? Well, you have the two protons. You collide the two protons. Now, the protons are not fundamental particles. They consist out of quarks and gluons. And you never know which quark, which gluon from one proton collides with the other one. So you have to select different processes. For example, two quarks. And once two quarks are coming together and producing two other quarks, then they have to get out back to back, and this creates a jet, jet of particles. And you see here very well, if you roll up the detector here from Atlas, you see very nicely these two energetic jets back to back. So this is what you measure, for example, as a bread and butter physics. That happens very, very often, and these, this is one of the basic processes at LHC. Now we want to get deeper and deeper, and one or closer and closer, deeper and deeper into the new physics. So what are the other processes? Now, for example, you can have the two protons and getting gluons together. And then, if you are lucky, you find Mr. Higgs, or his boson. And that could be, then in the CMS detector, this would be one of the nice signatures of this Higgs boson. However, there's one problem. If you look on the production rate of the various processes, you see on the top right the total production rate. And everything else, if you go lower and lower, this is a logarithmic scale, so 10 orders of magnitude, and then you are down at the new physics. Here is the new physics. So you need to go down. You have to dig into many, many, many collisions. You need a tremendous amount of data. That means the rate of new physics is much lower than the total rate, so we have to select one out of much more than 10 billion collisions in order to find possibly new physics. This is why we have to take so many data. Now, we have delivered last year quite a few data to the experiments, and you see in that scale, we promised this one to the experiments at the end of the year. This is a cumulated data Great. And you see, already in May, end of May, we achieved our goal. And we superseded our goal by a factor of five. We gave the experiments a factor of five more than we promised. Well, you can say, okay, if your promises are low enough, then you can always succeed it. The problem was that when we gave the promise, we did not have very much experience with the machine. And with the gaining experience, we could see it performed much better than expected. So we are here today. And given the fact that we are here today since quite some time already, I might know. Maybe I just show you what we do. If you go down from the very first measurements, already several orders of magnitude down to the Z and W, the carriers of the weak force, these are like candles, standard candles for particle physics. You have to be able to measure them. And this would look like a nice Z event. And what you do here, you measure the Z, and the Z is a standard candle, and you can reproduce it. Yellow is a simulation, and in black is the data. So you understand your detector. More interesting even is the W, because the W also emits a neutrino when it decays, and the neutrino is undetected, so it's missing energy, missing momentum. And you see in yellow again here the simulation, in black the data, so you understand your detector, you understand what you measure, and you even understand what you do not measure. And this is very important because missing energy is a signal for new physics. So this is very, very important to show that you can do that. You can do the same with a top quark. Then you have to go down in reaction rate even further. And then you see the first time top quark here and in Europe, because first it was, detected, it was found in the US. And this is a typical example in the Atlas detector, for example, for a top quark. And then the measurement, you see the measurement, this is the estimation from the standard model, and you see the measurements are top on. So the standard model 
has been reconfirmed at the high energy due to the excellent performance in 2010 and 2011, not only of the accelerator, but also of the experiments and the computing. So, experiments demonstrated their readiness to get in the exploitation of their data, and this is the rediscovery of the standard model on one transparency. You see, all our standard candles, the astronomers have their standard candles, they, they gauge the universe. These are our standard candles, which gauge our standard model. And we have rediscovered the standard model at the high energy. And now, we have to go into uncharted territory. Now we go into the new physics. And what is a new territory? Well, first of all, we still don't know Newton's unfinished business. What is mass? Yeah? Or why is there no more antimatter? What was matter like within the first moments of the universe life? And the little embarrassment, what is 96% of the world universe made of? Yeah? Come on, I mean, it took us 50 years for the 4%, 5%. But now, now is maybe the time to go into the 96%. So I hope you are now together with me ready to enter the dark universe. And let's start with dark matter. What well, dark matter, you don't don't forget it was nearly 25%, visible matter is 5%. Well, it's obvious that the 25% have shaped the universe much more than the 5%. So astronomy will tell us how it shaped it. But they will not tell us what it consists of. So you have to produce, you have to create, produce the uh, dark matter particles in the laboratory, at the accelerator, in order to investigate it, to study its properties. Is it just one kind of particle? Or is it more rich, more varied, like the visible world? We don't know. But the LHC may be the perfect machine to study dark matter. It's fantastic. So what is a good candidate? A good candidate is a so-called supersymmetry, which unifies the matter and forces. So for each particle in the standard model, a supersymmetric partner is introduced. I very often hear the remark from people, look, if physicists don't know what to do, they double the number of particles and they can explain much more. Don't forget, 80 years ago, a bit more than 80 years ago, antimatter was introduced and with, with this introduction the number of particles were doubled and we have gained a tremendous amount of knowledge from that, and today, as I said, we even use it in the hospital. I'm not saying that we will use supersymmetry in 40 years in hospitals, but maybe I'm not imaginative enough in order to imagine that. We'll see. But one of the, one of the main points is here at the bottom, the supersymmetry provides dark matter candidates. Why does it provide dark matter candidates? Because of its way of decaying. Now, here you have again, before I go into that, the standard model. And those of you who are still awake might remember the three generations, the three families, and the force <coughs> particles. And for each of this, you have another particle in the supersymmetry. So this is the way how it's done. Now you could produce at the proton collisions two supersymmetric particles. And now these supersymmetric particles then decay into a lower mass supersymmetric particle plus a normal particle another lower mass supersymmetric particle plus and, and a normal particle and so on until you reach the lowest mass supersymmetric particle. And this guy is very unfortunate. It doesn't have a partner to decay into. So it is stable, but it escapes the detector. So you have then two supersymmetric particles which will escape the detector. So it's missing energy, missing momentum. So this is what you have to detect. So the key issue is missing energy taken away by dark matter particles. And it could look like this in this event. You see here all the colors are the, the normal particles. And then to the left top, there is a dashed line. This is the missing momentum, missing energy. This could be the signature of such a supersymmetric lowest mass particle. The key issue again is to measure and understand missing energy. Because if you don't understand your detector, you can be fooled by your measurement. So, 
And this shows how well these detectors are performing. Again, in yellow is this, the, the, the simulation, and in black is the data. And these are several orders of magnitude. And this is the distribution of missing energy from the standard model and the measurement. And you see there's perfect agreement between expectation and data. So they understand their detectors. So now they could find supersymmetry. Yeah? And now comes a complicated plot. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. <laughs> this is a parameter space of supersymmetry, of one kind of supersymmetry. And you see, before the LHC was switched on, all this was allowed, the allowed space, and only the full color was the excluded space. And now, well, after only one and a half years of running the LHC, we are here. Everything here has been excluded. All this has been excluded. So it has been a fantastic step forward. I told them they should find it. Okay, they have only excluded it up to now. So, but this is only a constrained supersymmetric model. So there are many, many other models still open. Nonetheless, no supersymmetry yet, but the potential for discovering SUSI is sizable, even at the energy we are running now. And this could be the first light in the dark universe. So the LHC results should allow, together with the dedicated dark matter searches, first discoveries in the dark universe. However, still, around 73% of the universe are this mysterious dark energy, which is evenly spread. And the challenge is to get first hints about the world of dark energy in the laboratory. And now you remember, I haven't talked about the Higgs yet. And the Higgs is different. All particles have spin. The meta particles have their, their spin, and the force carries have their spin. The Higgs particles is, are different. They have no spin. They are scalars. And we have not yet found a scalar fundamental particle. We have not yet ever discovered a fundamental scalar. So the Higgs is neither matter nor force. It is just different. It would be the first fundamental scalar ever discovered. And the Higgs field, in order to give mass, is thought to fill the entire universe. Of course I'm not saying, and there's a disclaimer, the official disclaimer, I'm not saying that Higgs and dark energy is the same, but both are scalars. So could the study of the Higgs field give some handle on the scalar field of dark energy? It could well be, because it would be the first scalar which we ever see and study its properties. So that's a connection between dark energy and the Higgs field. The problem, as I told you already, is the production rate of the Higgs boson depends on its mass. It's very low. And in addition, this guy has the ability to decay in different particles. So the signature, the picture in the detector changes depending of its, uh, on its decay. When journalists are asking me, why does it take so long to find uh, something like the Higgs particle, I tell them, look, suppose there is a snowfall, big snowfall. And there, in this snowfall, you have a few special snowflakes, snowflakes. And you have to identify these snowflakes. But it's a little bit more difficult because the background is a snow field. So you have a snowfall in front of a snow field and you have to find some special snowflakes. It will take some time. You need a lot of statistics, you need a lot of snowfall. But eventually you will be there. And one of the nice things is you find a few pictures in the detector which enable you to dig out the special snowflake. And this is the bottom here where the Higgs boson decays, for example, into two photons, into gamma gamma. And this is a striking signature. Look, this is a real event. This is a striking signature. So the two red, red bars are the two photons. Very well seen. And the rest is just particles from the underlying event. So this would be a very good example of such a Higgs boson. But one is not enough because you have also standard model processes which could produce this background. So this is, so to speak, the snow field in the background. So we'll see. Where are the experiments today? Before I tell you that, I want to give you one key message on the LHC and the standard model. Finding the Higgs would be a discovery. Excluding the standard model Higgs would be also a discovery. Because in the first case, we would 
finish the picture, the, 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 the standard model. We would have all the stones of the standard model. If we exclude <coughs> the Higgs, then we have for the first time a big hole in the standard model. This would be exciting. Because then we have to find the replacement of the Higgs. Yeah? So in both cases it would be a discovery. Because it's not the Higgs what we are looking for. It's the, to clarify the mechanism by which the elementary particles get their mass. Okay, we hope that it's Mr. Higgs, but okay, we will see. So this is where we are today. That's from Atlas. We only have to, for the non-scientists, look at the dashed line at 1. Wherever you are below 1, you have excluded the Higgs boson by in, in the ma with this mass, which is plotted here. And once you are above the line, you have some possible signal. And if I zoom in into the low mass region here, you see everything below except here. Here we are above the 1. So when we started the LHC, the window for the Higgs was very far open. And now it's closing down. It's getting smaller and smaller. And this is the only window left over for the mass of the Higgs boson. And this is the job of this year. So where are we today? Well, the standard Merkel Higgs boson is excluded up to a mass of 600 GV, except for this window, 122 to 127 GV. So it's a very tiny window. However, there are, and this is the official language, interesting fluctuations around the masses of 124 to 126 in both experiments. And once you have interesting fluctuations in one experiment, fine. But if you have it in both experiments, okay, that becomes intriguing. So, what can we expect for this year? Well, we go up in energy from 7 TV to 8 TV, and the expected amount of data is three times more this year than last year, so altogether we will have four times more data in order to analyze. So this is why I do one thing which a director general never should do. I predict the future. And I predicted it already end of last year, and I said, because of the excellent performance of Collider experiments in computing, we will get an answer end of this year on the Shakespeare question concerning the Higgs boson. To be or not to be. That we will solve end of this year. We will know it. So you have to stay tuned and you will, you will hear that. So we will either discover it or rule it out end of this year. So, LHC results will allow to study the Higgs mechanism in detail and to reveal it, the character of the Higgs boson. And as I said, this would be the first, the very first in the investigation of a scalar field. And this could maybe the, be the very first, very, very first step to understanding dark energy. It would be huge, it would be a fantastic progress. Great. So the past decades, four decades, five decades, just saw precision studies of merely 5% of our universe. The discovery of the standard model. Nice. But we have to go further. The LHC delivers data. I think today we are just at the beginning of exploring 95% of our universe. And I can only say the future is bright in the dark universe. Thank you.